Mike Bubolo with Sony Electronics. I'm the national sales manager for digital imaging products and for photo specialty. So I cover all the photo specialty stores in the country, such as B and H. And um, we're very Sony is very committed to digital imaging. As a matter of fact, I mean if you follow um, just business in general, Sony's number one priority right now is digital imaging, and the number two priority is is mobile mobile being cell phones and tablets and such. So the entire company of Sony, uh, our main priority is creating newer and better technology for our digital imaging products. So it's a pretty exciting time to be at Sony. So I have experience, I worked for Canon for about five, four years, five years as a tech rep, senior tech rep and an engineer bringing out new products and things like that. So I have my MFA in photography, so I am a photographer as well. So that's it. Sony introduced two new CyberShot cameras. The, neither one of them is a replacement for a camera. So what we did differently with this time around is that we actually added products to the lineup. So we added an RX100 Mark II, still keeping the RX100 around, hitting a different price point. And we also added an RX1R. So in addition to the RX1, the full frame point and shoot camera, we just added a feature, well we actually eliminated a feature technically, where we took away the low pass filter. So, which means that all four cameras are still going to be current and they're still going to be carrying on through the year. So it's something a little bit different for us, but it enables us to reach a broader audience and bring out newer and better technology. So these are them, RX100 Mark II and the RX1R. Both of them look almost identical to their counterparts. So the RX1R is physically identical to what it's replacing. And the only difference that you can see from this picture is that, oops, that you can see from this picture, is there a little pointer on this? Nope. Is that they have, it has a hot shoe, so. A hot shoe. So it has the, the hot shoe on top, so you can attach viewfinders, flashes, things like that. So that's the original RX, is that the RX100 Mark II? That's the RX100, the original RX100. So that's the one of the main differences with the newer version is that it has a hot shoe and such. So one thing that about Sony that we like to talk about is that in the digital imaging world, Sony makes about 60 to 70 percent of the world's sensors. So we're the largest sensor manufacturer in the world by far. We're the only manufacturer that makes our own sensors, our own lenses, our own processors and puts them in the cameras. Beyond this, we also make our own LCD screens, we make our own batteries, we make our own silicone, we make everything in the cameras on our own, in our own factories. So that's how we're able to keep cost, have the technology, the latest and greatest technology, but also able to keep costs down. And it's no secret that our sensors are used in our competitors' products, such as Nikon and Canon and, and other manufacturers. <laughs> so we are the most trusted sensor manufacturer in the world. So, we're going to go over the RX1R first. So, a quick little introduction to the RX1R. It still has the same roots as its RX1, where it's a full frame camera packed into, it's the world's smallest full frame camera, digital full frame camera ever made. So, it does have a fixed 35 millimeter f2 lens, and it's not removable. As, as removable as it looks, you can remove it, but it'll only come off once and you probably have to send it in to get repaired after that. But um, it's an absolutely stunning product. Since its introduction last year, uh, it's gotten many awards. The best full frame quality of any 35 millimeter full frame camera ever made, digital camera ever made. Uh, one of the best 35 millimeter lenses tested. It's just an absolutely stunning product. So and as you can see, the RX1R, the main difference in this camera is that we took away the optical low pass filter. We didn't actually just negate the, the, um, the effects of that low-pass filter. We removed it out of the camera altogether. And we didn't even charge for it. We didn't, we didn't charge to take it out. So <laughs> it's actually the same exact price. So this enables us to keep the same exact resolution, 24 megapixels, but essentially giving you the impact or the illusion of more resolution by giving you without all the, the work that the optical low pass filter does. So even a little teeny tiny section, you'll be able to blow up at 100% and be able to just get unreal resolution. It's absolutely unbelievable. So you'll have a perceived resolution of almost double 24, so almost 48 megapixel resolution. 
Of course, the heart, like we talked about, the full frame Exmor, uh, Exmor sensor. So the same exact characteristics as the RX-1. The only difference is, again, removing the optical low pass filter. And it also adds triluminous support. What does that mean? When you attach to one of the new Sony triluminous TVs, like a 4K TV, it'll give you a full uncompressed signal and be able to give you a full Adobe RGB color space. So exactly what you capture on the camera is exactly what you can capture on your five to ten thousand dollar 4K TV if you have a 4K TV. So and also the new XBR line, but we won't talk about that. So. So why would we carry both cameras? Why have an RX1R and why have an RX1? Why wouldn't I, if it's such a great resolution, why wouldn't I just buy the RX1R? It doesn't make any sense. So when you take away why that optical low pass filter originally existed and why it's there in the RX1 is that it does do certain things. It does get rid of Moye patterns and it does get rid of some artifacting in certain situations like uh, very detailed architecture or very detailed shirts for portraiture. Like your striped shirt right now, if we took it with this camera, you might get some artifacting depending on how the lighting is hitting the stripes and things like that. So there are certain situations in which you will start to notice a disadvantage compared to a normal RX-1. But through processing, through um, just new engineering with the sensor itself, we're able to cut that down drastically. And we'll have examples of that moving forward. But that's the reason why we're still keeping the RX-1 in the lineup, because for someone who mainly shoots architecture, or someone who mainly shoots um, very fine detail and very structured man-made detail, uh, then the RX-1 is absolutely for you. So. This confidential, uh, it's going to be on the web, so you can take a photograph. Yeah. I, just, I'm, I forgot to take away the confidential. This is since the camera was just introduced two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, it was confidential before then. 24.3 megapixels. Now, a lot of the times people always say, well, you have so many megapixels and such a little space, but now we're talking about not such a little space. It's actually a pretty large space. But even though it's such a large space, it's still two and a half times the size of APS-C. APS-C is really growing in popularity. Oh. Because APS-C is still extremely large for an interchangeable lens camera. Olympus has micro four thirds. The RX100 and the Nikon 1 series are all 1-inch sensors. So even though it's a very large sensor for an interchangeable lens camera that enables you to do a lot, full frame is still much, much bigger. Two and a half times the size, 2.4 to be exact. So that two and a half times the size, which means you're going to get two and a half times the light gathering area. You're going to get two and a half times the area to be able to capture detail, to be able to, catch, to capture tones. The same size sensor that's in our professional A99 which means it's going to give you just spectacular image quality. And remember, the size is the same. It's, it's not much larger than the RX100. It's actually a pretty small camera for what it is. Yes, the lens does protrude, but it still is, has a sensor that is extremely large. A full frame sensor enables you to get unbelievable bokeh, really unbelievable background blur, because what really separates a professional camera from a regular camera, what separates a snapshot from a photograph is being able to separate your subject from its background. I mean, this was my, I hate to say it on, on film, but my dirty apartment. And so I'm able to just take a picture of my dog and be able to completely blur out that background. Even though the background's only a foot and a half to two feet away, I was still able to get that really nice soft bokeh behind them and be able to completely blur it out. So same thing with portraits. Same, it just enables you to get spectacular image quality. Nine blade circular aperture, so you're going to get pretty, you're going to get unbelievable bokeh. It also has a leaf shutter. So what is a leaf shutter? That means the shutter, instead of a focal plane shutter that goes in front of the lens, that's actually built into the camera itself where it goes up and down, a leaf shutter is built where the, with the aperture where it actually uses the same aperture blades and closes down and opens up. So this enables you to sync at any shutter speed up to 4,000th of a second, any shutter speed of the camera itself. And it also enables you to just have it completely silent. So when you take a picture with the RX-1 or the RX-1R, it, well, that's actually got fake sound. I probably should have set that up beforehand. But 
audio signals off. So when you take a picture, it's completely silent. So, and again, you're going to be able to get the best image quality of any full frame camera out there in a camera that really doesn't look like much. So you can be able to take completely 100% professional images, the best image quality that you can get, and still have a camera that can not weigh you down throughout the day. In fact, that it never really comes off my shoulder. You can see that the straps even on my RX1. RX1 comes with me every single place that I go. It just has that great image quality. Because you know what? Not all of us always want to carry around. These do have its advantages, but having this around your neck all day long, A, just gets really heavy and cumbersome. B, it also, sometimes you don't want to be noticed when you're taking pictures. Sometimes you just want to take pictures and kind of be on your own. And this is where the RX100 and the RX1R and the RX1 really come into play. So we took out that low pass filter. So a bunch of geek talk here. But when you take away that low pass filter, you're able to just get much higher detail. Because the point of that low pass filter is to be able to concentrate light and then put it onto the sensor. Even though it looks, it's perceived to us as as sharp as it gets, we never saw really images that took away the optical low pass filter. We're really the first ones that actually took it out of the camera altogether. Remember, not just negating, like some other manufacturers have negated the effect of the optical low pass filter, we actually just took it away. So we're able to get supreme resolution. Now, another thing that we did with this camera is that we did adaptive noise reduction. What does that mean? So instead of just doing universal noise reduction on, in the camera, where it'll just, let's say you're shooting at 6400 or 3200 or 12,800 ISO, instead of just doing the same maintenance across the entire scene, we can actually separate into three different sections. Continuous color area like skies or something that has a solid color. Texture areas like you see there on the, on the um, on the building, and then edges, people, and places in the, within the picture that have very fine detail and, and edge-related details. So this way we can separate the images into 126,000 different zones and be able to see in every single pixel how that processing needs to be made, and it does it separately on every single image instantaneously. Where it doesn't slow down, you can be shooting in JPEG at on this camera at three frames a second, three and a half frames a second, and be able to continuously shoot, and the camera's gonna keep up with it and do the noise reduction at the same time. So. So, are the effects really there? Okay, so that's great. You took away the low pass filter, but do you really see the results? Obviously, we're working off a projector here. Even though it's a pretty, it's a very good projector, it still can't show you the same results as prints. Unfortunately, I kind of lost the prints. We brought them to another show and, and they haven't, I didn't lose them, they're just not here yet. I was shipping them back to New York, they're not here. It is what it is. But you can see them on my computer screen afterwards if you like. But with the RX-1, you do have fine detail even at 100%. And then when you get into the RX-1R, you're just gonna get that punch, that detail that people are always looking for. People always want sharper, people always want better. And when you compare it to a competitor's digital SLR, uh, that negates the effects of an optical low pass filter, the E version, you'll see that it's not even actually as sharp as the RX1R. And these are just real world tests that me and uh, my team have put together, straight JPEGs out of the camera, no processing, no nothing. So you're able to actually see the differences right here. You can come up and see them on the screen or even here you can actually see some of the results. But even if you have fine detail, I don't want to scare people away from taking away their optical low pass filter. Even when you take, a, take it away and you shoot things with fine detail like tapestry, you're going to see that you just get supreme detail in almost every single situation. So, we said, you know what? Without an optical low pass filter, it will give you Moyer patterns, it will give you artifacting in certain situations, but you can tell that even compared to the ARCS-1, it's barely noticeable. In, in these sections, you can see it a little bit, you'll see a little bit of patterning here, but it's not anywhere near what some of the other manufacturers do when they remove the effect of the optical low pass filter. And this is because the camera, using that, uh, that zonal control, being able to see different situations, that noise reduction technology, we also use to process and analyze the images for Moyer patterns. So we're able to see that the camera will have a problem with this section and it'll be able to process it separately from the rest of the picture itself. So. 
but it does have unbelievable detail. Just unbelievable. Normally people, digital has turned us all into pixel, pixel peepers. We all know it. You go into Photoshop, zoom, 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 zoom. Well, my picture isn't quite sharp at 1,000%. Well, you're at 1,000%, sir. I, I don't really know what to tell you. You can't possibly get your face that close to a print. But I'll took it, I took another step, and now we're at 250% into the image, and you're still retaining detail. That is just kind of ridiculous, to be honest. It's, it's unbelievable. Tonal range, that is just superb. And remember, these are just untouched JPEGs. These aren't raws that are converted and processed through a professional image processor. These are JPEGs that we got from our team in Japan, straight out of the camera, even has the image data verification kit connected to it, and you can just see the detail out of the images that are just spectacular. Again, being able to remain, keep detail, just better than anything that you've ever seen before on a 35 millimeter camera. And so far, initial tests that we've had have actually seen that this camera has, can give you detail that surpasses even a lot of the medium format cameras out there. But remember, the one limitation to this camera is that you do have a fixed 35 millimeter lens. So, since the RX1R is so small, a lot of people do want to add a viewfinder. They are disappointed it doesn't have a viewfinder, but to, to, don't dismay. I mean, we do have an optical viewfinder. We also have a digital OLED viewfinder, which we'll get into in a second. And of course, it works with our microphones, it works with our LED flash, our new 43M flash, and the such. Wider range of accessories, cases, you name it. But we don't want to get too far into that. So that's the RX1R. So the RX100 Mark II. So, the, oh, thanks. Thank you. The big, the RX100 Mark II is a pretty substantial upgrade to the RX100. The RX100, as you know, got camera of the year. It got rated by many people as the best point-and-shoot camera ever made. David Pogg of the New York Times named it the best point-and-shoot camera ever made. Not just that he's ever used, just period, ever made. And you know what? It is. And this is actually a sensor that we didn't give to our competitors. It's our own one-inch sensor made by us. It's not the same one-inch sensor that's in competitive products. So, and you can really tell the difference when you compare the images at our camera compared to those other cameras. But so the camera, the heart of the camera, it uses a one inch CMOS sensor. So that's great. So did the RX100. So what we did differently here is that we made it a backlit XMAR uh, R CMOS sensor. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So it essentially gives you just unbelievable high ISO. So even at 3200, you're going to get pictures that now we can start talking about that rival competitors, APS-C digital SLRs. So the Rebels and the D-Series cameras of the world will be severely challenged by an RX100 Mark II, no doubt. And the detail, 20 megapixels, backlit CMOS sensor, doesn't just give you better high ISO, doesn't just give you better <laughs> results in low light, but it also gives you just unbelievably sharp, ridiculous detail. So not RX1R detail, but as you can see, even at 150 to 200 percent, still gives you very, very good detail. For a camera, I like to call the RX1, RX1 a pocket camera, but that's kind of stretching it a little bit. It's a, it's a go-everywhere camera, I like to call it. But the RX100 literally is a pocket camera where it can fit in your pocket and can go with you everywhere you go. So. Again. The heart of the RX100 is also, not the heart, but the, let's say the lungs of the RX100 is the same as the RX100 Mark II, where it still uses the same Zeiss T-star coated lens. It's a 1.8 lens at 28, megapic, at 28, and it goes out to 100, mega, uh, 100 millimeters. So let's say it's about a 28 to 100. So it does keep its 1.8 to about 35, and then it goes to 2, and then it goes to 2.8, and then eventually it gets to 3.5, but not until you get over 75 millimeters. So it will be fast for a very long range uh, throughout the lens. So it's the world's first one inch back illuminated CMOS sensor. So it's the largest back illuminated sensor ever made. And you can see that it's 41% more light gathering than the original RX100. And the RX100, as you know, 
if this never came out, would still be the world's best point and shoot camera. And nothing else has rivaled it yet. So, and it still had unbelievable low, uh, high ISO quality, low light capability. We just made it 41% better. So it's like just having the best product in the world and then just taking it another step further and just making one that is even better. So I'm sorry for all the people that's just that have an RX100, but <laughs> <We hate you. laughs> another thing that we wanted to add since when the RX100 first came out, we weren't exactly sure how the public was really going to perceive it because it was a very expensive camera for us to make all this technology and to make this large sensor and to make this T-Star coated Zeiss lens at 1.8 we did need to come out with it at $649. We didn't know how people were going to adapt to it and it turns out that it was the highest selling point and shoot camera ever made. So not only was it the best point and shoot camera ever made but it was the highest selling point and shoot camera ever made. So but there were some limitations for some people where they noticed they found themselves, like me, wanting to bring it around with them everywhere they go. So they were professional photographers, they were serious amateur photographers, but this was the camera that they shot every day, and then they used their professional cameras for when they're actually getting paid for work and things. So they wanted a hot shoe, they wanted a tilting LCD, they wanted some of the features from their high-end cameras, and that's exactly what we did. So we made the sensor even better, we added a multi-interface shoe so you can connect flashes to it, the same flashes that we talked about with the RX1R. So you can do wireless flash with this. You can actually use this as a studio camera and make it a pretty spectacular studio camera. You can add microphone to it so you can get stereo microphone. Um, if you're really seriously high-end, you can actually do adapters through this and get high-end audio, higher-end audio. And another thing we added was the LCD screen. And we talked about it a little bit beforehand, but for the people on the internet and stuff, they weren't here. When tilting LCD screens first came out, people kind of saw it as a cheesy <coughs> upgrade to a camera. When, when Live View first came out, everyone was kicking and screaming that Live View first came out where you can see the image on the LCD screen. Don't get me wrong, I was one of those people because photographers don't really like change, but you know, it is what it is. We adapted, we don't shoot film that much anymore. But the great thing about having a tilting LCD screen is that you don't have to go crazy trying to get a unique angle. So I can put it above my head, tilt it down, no more lying on the ground and looking crazy, especially in the city, you don't ever really want to crawl around on the ground. But this way you can go down and get a unique angle of things with just tilting the LCD screen up. And it really does have significant advantages. And so we added all these things to the camera and there's almost identical size compared to the RX100. The LCD screen adds a few millimeters to the back, but mostly we just were able to eat away at the actual size of the RX100 to be able to um, accommodate the LCD screen. And you can see the top to bottom comparison is almost minimal as well. The only difference is this little bump from, from the, from the uh, hot shoe itself. Another thing that we added to this camera, there's two more things that we add to the camera is that it's 1920 by 1080, so full HD, same as the RX100. 60 progressive frames per second, so it's almost double the frame rate of any other competitor camera out there. But what we added this time is 24p. People love 24. 24p is what, is what film uses, and what originally what film used, uh, and people just like the look. Because video is a little bit different than, obviously a lot different than photography, where 24p just gives you a different motion and a different look than 60p. 60p gives you super milky smooth motion as opposed to 24p. If you're shooting something with very fast motion, you'll see jitters. So, And the last but not least, one other thing that we added to this camera is uh, a step zoom via the ring itself. What does that mean? So when you're actually using the zoom control, you don't have to use this toggle to be able to zoom. A lot of people just want 24 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, 85 millimeter, 100 millimeter. They're used to those exact specifications when they're using their cameras because they're used to fixed lenses, like myself. I like fixed lenses. So what you can do is on the ring, you can actually dial it 24 mil. So you do one click, 24 millimeters, another click, 35, another click, 50, another click, 85, and then be done with it. So that way you don't have to worry about going back and forth, back and forth, and then seeing the millimeters on the screen, you can actually just go click, 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 and be done with it. So it's actually a really 
useful feature that we brought out. And it was actually from feedback from customers. A lot of people said, hey, you know what, this would be a good idea. And since Sony is new to the photo industry, we're very receptive to people's feedback. So if you guys give me feedback, I literally go home and relay that feedback to the engineers in Japan and they can, and they listen to us. It's up to them to figure out. I mean, I can give it to them, but when it comes to there, then it's up to them to be able to figure out what they want to do with it. So, then last but not least, we added Wi-Fi to the camera as well. So Wi-Fi and NFC. And we'll get into the, the features of that in a second. So we, we keep talking about back illuminated. What does back illuminated mean? So most sensors, or almost well, actually all sensors, the way they originally designed them, for some reason the electron, you have the light sensitive material here, and the electronics to be able to transfer all that information and actually make an image out of it is on top of the light sensitive area, which doesn't seem to make much sense. So what we did was we just moved that light sensitive material behind. So that way we're essentially doubling or 40, getting 41% more light to the area, to the light sensitive area. It's like shining a flashlight and then putting a window screen in front of it. Those are the electronics. You are gonna, you still get light through, a lot of light, and it still gave you great results, but now you're gonna get 41% more light. So it does give you, and that of course combined with a super bright lens is gonna give you fantastic results. 12,800 ISO. So again, the RX100 did a fantastic job, but we always want better, we can always get better, and we did, about a stop and a half better, high ISO. High ISO. Even compare, this is where we're going to start comparing it to uh, APS-C sensors. So red stands for, you know, yellow stands for, you know. But the RX100 Mark II compared to some of the APS-C cameras is still at the top of the line, not top of the line, the uh, comparatively priced APS-C model is going to give you the same, if not better, high ISO quality. And again, this is that same shot we saw before at ISO 3200. And even at zoomed in to 200%, you're going to see that you not only retain very, very good detail, but you have minimal noise, even at ISO 3200, on a very comparatively small sensor compared to our large professional cameras. So again, a camera, this is why we made this camera a little bit more versatile, because even people that want to be able to just have this as their only camera and not take these big cameras around can feel comfortable. I feel comfortable enough that I actually have been on, I travel a lot and I've been on a lot of trips this month and I actually didn't bring my big camera with me this time. I just brought the RX100 and the RX1R. So the RX1R I mostly brought around because I wanted to test it out and show you guys some results. But again, even though at ISO 800 you're going to be able to get results that don't have noise at all. I mean, it's, it's just pretty spectacular. And the sharpness is pretty s superb as well. So, these cameras use, both these cameras that we're talking about today both use contrast-based autofocus. So what does contrast-based mean? It means the, diff the main difference between this camera and these cameras is that it doesn't have a mirror, which means it doesn't have its own autofocusing system which means that it has to use the sensor to autofocus. Since we made that sensor more sensitive to light, 41% more sensitive to light, it means that our autofocus is also going to be much more accurate and much more and much quicker in low light. So it means so we're going to get AF performance, not 41% because that's just I don't know, we just can't do it. So but we are able to improve autofocus by up to 10%. 10% goes a long way when you're in that tricky situation in low light where you're trying to, the camera's trying to hunt the focus. So instead of having to go to manual focus, you're just going to get slightly better autofocus as before. Same MTF chart, but here again, comparing it to APS-C models and comparing it to the larger 1.5 inch point and shoot cameras from other manufacturers, you can see that even the detail, not just the high ISO, but being able to capture that much more light is also going to help us in sharpness and it's also going to help us in tonal range. So not only do we get a stop and half better high ISO, but we're going to get about a stop to a stop and half better tonal range and just sharper images altogether. 
So it's able to actually come closer to what the lens can actually perform. So that lens, the T-star coated lens, actually performs extremely well. And we're able to release as much as we can. So a one inch sensor. We talked about full frame and the ridiculous background blur you can get with full frame. Because in the digital world, we're so used to APS-C, we're used to point and shoots. So full frame is really the pinnacle of what you can get uh, when it comes to separating your subject from the background. But even that one inch sensor for a point and shoot camera, remember that point and shoot camera sensor is smaller than your pinky nail. One over 2.3, one over 2.8 inches, it's extremely small. So one inch is about four times, four to six times larger than what you get in a point and shoot camera. But at 1.8, where in that large sensor, we're able to combine to be able to get really good background blur, blur, really good bokeh. And as you know with the RX100, it has really good macro. You don't have to set it to macro. The camera just is able to do extremely good close focusing. So you're able to get a few inches away from your subject and really be able to get close to your subject and really separate that background. So you're able to get APS-C, or I don't want to say full frame, but you're able to get APS-C type background blur just because how close you're able to get to the subject and still be able to have a large sensor. But we talked about how sharp the camera can be and in a lot of ways can replace a lot of a person's camera, especially someone that's just stepping up to a camera for the first time and wants to get into an SLR or wants to get into a mirrorless camera. A lot of people do move over to the RX100 because the images are so good. And to be honest, I mean, it does compete with our own cameras. So it's like we make everything. We make the best point and shoot, the best mirrorless, and arguably the best SLR camera in the world. So when you make something this good, it does kind of compete with this. So it is a challenge that we have to deal with, but at least it's a challenge between our own products. So I don't mind too bad. But this can really be someone's only camera, to be honest. So, and a lot of people do choose it as their only camera. We talked about the rotating LCD screen. Something that, that kind of goes unnoticed because a lot of LCD screens are really good out there in the market. But someone did bring up before the, before the presentation started that it's really good in, in sunny weather. It's really good in bright light. We remember the days where LCD screens weren't very good in, in sunny weather. Because the way that LCD screens used to be made is that there would be, that's not safe, but there was your LCD screen and then there were a few layers, there was a layer of glue and then there was a layer of glass and there was a layer of glue and then there was a layer of anti-reflective plastic. So all those layers, the light would get in and it would reflect off of it and it would get washed out. So we're able to keep that very minimal so we're able to actually have the LCD screen and then be able to just have the glass right on top of it. So you're able to get really bright images even in bright light and the, can, the LCD screen obviously will automatically turn itself into sunny weather mode to be able to give you extreme detail and extreme visibility without sacrificing too much detail out in bright sunlight. Especially now that you're going to be able to rotate it and use it as a, com a composition device. We talked about the rotating uh, control dial. So we'll have, oh I said 24 before, I apologize, it's 28 millimeters. So I don't want to confuse you. So 28, 35, 50, 70, 100. So this way you're able to actually just set those settings right on your right on your uh, camera and be able to do that exact step. Movies. That's one of the best things that kind of got stumbled upon in the industry a few years ago or six years ago is that we have these giant sensors. Let's, if we can record video out of it, let's do it. So and obviously this has really progressed to the point where the camcorder market is, is struggling right now. The consumer camcorder market is struggling and the professional camcorder market is really kind of thriving because they use these large sensors to be able to record video. So that same still image quality with that great bokeh, with that great low ISO, low, I mean high ISO, low light capability, you can get in movie capabilities. So you can shoot in movies, be able to get full autofocus, be able to shoot in manual, be able to shoot in shutter priority, be able to shoot in aperture priority. So the same versatility you're used to in an extreme high-end video camera or a higher end professional SLR, you can get out of the RX100. And since we added 24P, which is where most professionals and artists like to shoot in, now there's really almost no sacrifice when moving or using it as a second camera or using it as your only camera as opposed to a much larger camera. 
and a lot of people do, since the, the cameras are smaller and smaller and smaller, but there still needs to be some physical buttons. And a lot of people complain about hitting the movie button. And they're all of a sudden they're like, I just took a 28 minute video of my feet. It's really kind of annoying. So we do have the ability to disable the movie button and be able to, you have to actually go to the movie setting on the dial and then the movie button becomes enabled. So, which is good and bad because sometimes you just want to be able to take a quick video and be able to hit that button. But if you ever pick up one of my cameras that I personally use, it's always disabled because I'm the clumsy guy that has 1,500 videos of his feet. So, or you don't know what it is because you're, so. Records audio too, so I'm just kidding. But you can get professional looking quality. You're able to get that professional background blur, that professional bokeh, as opposed to a point and shoot camera or a consumer video camera that uses that small 1 over 2.88 or 1 over 2.3 inch sensor where you can't separate your subject from the background. So most point and shoot cameras have that, or all point and shoot cameras except for this camera and the Canon G1X really, use a smaller sensor can't separate that background. So this is what really separates your snapshots into, turns your snapshots into photographs. This is what really separates your photography and kind of makes you take that next step. And of course with autofocus, you're able to move and autofocus on your subject as it's moving and be able to get really professional looking video out of a camera that can seriously fit in your pocket. Great background blur, again, because you can get really close focus to your subject. And then you can move your focusing or manually focus and be able to just get unbelievable looking video quality. So even though it's 10% faster and more accurate and low light you're focusing, both of our cameras, now we're talking about the RX100 and the RX1R, have peaking focus. So what is peaking focus? Again, to borrow from the video world, it's something that enables you to manually focus, but it'll overlay a color on the LCD screen over what's sharp and what isn't. So as I move my ring, I set it to peaking focus, I move my uh, focusing ring to back to front, and you'll see the yellow shift from back to front. So whatever's in focus will glow yellow. You can also set it to red or you can set it to white. So whatever, see this way you can manually focus your camera extremely fast. So even if, because a lot of the times manual focus, especially when, Back in the day, we were used to manual focus, but it was really big, bright viewfinders, and it would just be gorgeous. But now it's a little bit more difficult. So especially with a camera that, say, that doesn't have a viewfinder, you're able to use your LCD screen and be able to manual focus almost as fast as you can autofocus. This is especially important when you talk about the mirrorless cameras, because the mirrorless cameras, you can connect any other person's lens to it. So if you have a Canon lens or a Nikon lens or any or an old Minolta lens from back in the day, you can convert it to the NEX system and it'll be manual focus, but you'll still be able to use peaking as well. So it's also very helpful because when you really have that strong separation of subject and background, things can get out of focus fast. Or the fine detail from one inch behind the subject's eye to one inch in front can really start to make a really big difference. So being able to have manual focus with peaking can really help out. So. One thing that we also added that we created a new uh, remote commander for the multi-interface shoe for the RX100. So this way you can put the adapter onto the, uh, onto the uh, multi-interface shoe and then you can use a remote control to be able to control the camera itself. And we also, the same accessories that work on the RX1R are also compatible with the RX100 Mark II, which is more, more popular, which is the 20M flash, even though the camera has a built-in flash, but now you can do wireless flash with the point-and-shoot camera. And the viewfinder, the full OLED 2.4 megapixel viewfinder. And this is what we're going to talk about because it is such a beautiful piece. It is the same exact hardware that's built into the A99. So that same exact viewing experience that you get in the A99, you're going to be able to get with the attachment that you can put on the RX1R and the RX100 Mark II. So it's a 2.4 million pixel OLED viewfinder. Why, since you don't really, now we're not really competing with optical viewfinders, I still want to talk about the difference between optical viewfinders and OLED viewfinders, digital viewfinders. Because as soon as people hear digital viewfinder, 
they automatically think of the digital viewfinders of old, the old LCD viewfinders that just kind of really look digital. So if you've never looked through an OLED viewfinder, you really need to do yourself a favor and look through it because it kind of changes all your perceptions about digital viewfinders. It actually looks like reality. The blacks are black. The whites are accurate. The color detail and the color reproduction is phenomenal. It also enables us, and a lot of the times, digital viewfinders are very slow. Now when I say slow, it's very jittery. It's very slow. It's very you can't follow motion like your eye. So with a very fast refresh rate, there's almost no loss of refresh rate or loss of detail when you're moving yourself from one side to the other. It also is able to give you full sRGB color space out of an OLED viewfinder. So almost all the colors that you're able to capture on the image sensor, you're able to capture in the viewing in the uh, LCD, I mean OLED. And even though I was kicking and screaming when our SLTs went to digital viewfinders, once you start using that digital viewfinder, you realize that it really is the future. And it does make sense to use a digital viewfinder, not an optical viewfinder, because it enables you to shoot faster, because exactly what you see is exactly what you're going to get. So if you look through the viewfinder and you're like, hey, it's really dark. This viewfinder stinks. Well, your, your, like your, uh, your exposure is going to be dark. If you look through it and you say, it's extremely bright. Well, you know what? Your exposure is going to be bright. It's going to be overexposed. Or white balance. If it looks yellow or if it looks blue or if it looks green, those settings are going to be live on your display, live through the viewfinder. So this way you don't have to take separate pictures, a separate picture for your white balance, a separate picture for your exposure, a separate picture for whatever your picture effect is or whatever you want to shoot in. You're able to see all this live while you're shooting. Even in movies, you're able to shoot movies through the viewfinder as opposed to using just the LCD screen. So, and of course, we can overlay all the information that you can overlay over the LCD screen into the viewfinder and you can set them independently. So let's say you like to use the digital level in your viewfinder, but you don't like it on the LCD screen, you can actually change those independently. So, excluding the Instagram. A few new accessories that we're also introducing with the RX100 Mark II is that we're actually adding a grip to it. Because even though we wanted to make the camera as small as possible, and it is magnesium alloy, it can get slippery. And it is, especially with people with bigger hands where you can't, like it kind of loses the camera, it doesn't, you want a little bit more. You want a little bit more substantial grip. So we did, we did come out with a, uh, a stick-on grip. It sounds cheap, it sounds cheesy, but it actually feels very good in the hand. It fits on securely. It looks like it's actually part of the camera itself. So it's relatively inexpensive. I believe it's $20 or $24, I'm not sure. And we're also coming out with one of the things that people need to overcome is that you can't use filters. You couldn't use filters on the camera. So no polarizer, or if you wanted to use a neutral density filter, you couldn't do that on the camera. So we came out with a magnetic uh, filter system where you can actually connect it to the front of the lens It'll stay there, it works on the RX100 Mark II and the RX100, and you can use uh, 49 millimeter filters. So the same filters you might have at home, or filters that you can buy anywhere, no, uh, however, whatever quality you want, uh, will be able to work on the RX100 and the RX100 Mark II. So for someone that loves neutral density filters, and everyone should have a polarizer too, now you can use it on your RX100. So we talked about Wi-Fi and NFC. Why would you want that in a camera? Why are all these cameras coming out with Wi-Fi and NFC? It's kind of annoying. But it actually gives you a lot. It's the same thing as coming out with an electronic viewfinder, or moving your LCD screen, or live view. It's something that we never realized that we wanted until it's actually there. So this camera has Wi-Fi, which means I can connect to my uh, tablet, or I can connect to my phone, whether it's Apple iOS, whether it's Android or Windows Mobile, I can connect to it wirelessly and I can use my phone or my tablet as a remote control or a remote viewfinder. So I can have my tablet out on the side and I can have my camera here and I can act the, the phone or the tablet will be able to see exactly what the camera is seeing. I can shoot from the camera, I can shoot from the tablet. I can browse the images that are on my phone 
from the tablet or from the from the phone. This kind of a lot of people you see it all the time. I'm I fall in victim to it as well. But everyone shoots with their cell phone. It's always on them. Everyone always has their cell phone on them. They're like, oh, let me let me shoot this. I just ate a cheeseburger. I'm going to shoot it and share it with the world. So, but now you can actually get really really good pictures of that cheeseburger and share them with the world. So now you can shoot and instantly connect to your phone or instantly connect to your tablet and share it right there on the spot. And to go even even step further and faster than that, the camera now has NFC. So Apple doesn't have NFC yet, but um, when they do, I'm sure it's going to be a humongous deal. Um, but most Android devices do have NFC, which means you just take your tablet. Unfortunately, I don't have it hooked up. It's a pre-production camera. Um, but you literally just take your camera and your tablet, it's got the NFC logo, touch it to itself, touch them together, and all of a sudden they're connected, transferring everything that you want to transfer, automatically uploading to Facebook if you want, automatically putting them on YouTube, and that's it, you're ready to rock and roll. No other connections, no other anything, as long, and there's not really, you don't have to worry about security because NFC is near field communication. It has to be a half inch or touching the device. So you touch it, they marry each other, they talk, and all your images and your videos are transferred over. So it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> Two other things, I mean, little things that the camera also has. Triluminous color, like we talked about, just gives you full accurate representation on a TV with triluminous color. For those of us that are using the RX100 Mark II as our first cameras, which a lot of people are, it does have auto object framing. So people say, oh, is it just going to take the picture for you? Like, it's got so many features. Well, it kind of does now, because you can take your shot, and then the camera's like, hey, your composition is terrible. I'm going to compose it right. So and it'll automatically crop it and give you an output image at 20 megapixels. So it's pretty cool, but it's something that you can obviously turn off very easily. <laughs> So, we talked about the differences between the RX-1 and the RX-1R. There wasn't too much. It was just removing the optical low-pass filter, giving you supreme resolution, and adding that triluminous color. Okay. But the differences between the RX-100 and the RX-100 Mark II are, are a lot more substantial. So you get that much better image sensor, so 41% more light, and then uh, no problem. And then, of course, it adds 24p, so you get that professional-looking video, that more traditional... Uh, art looking video, tiltable LCD screen, multi multiple interface shoes, so you can add a viewfinder, you can add a flash, you can add a microphone, and of course Wi-Fi and NFC for instant sharing of your awesome photos and videos, and NFC for being able to easily and flawlessly connecting your phone to your camera, so, or your tablet, whichever. So we talked about the size. The size is almost identical, 2.4 millimeters thicker. So I don't know how wide a credit card is, but probably the size of a credit card. <laughs> and then uh, the height is almost exactly the same. Now a few of the, just to quickly go over it, a few of the things that Sony does that are a little bit unique to us that all of our cameras have that just kind of make us more desirable to me is that we have certain technologies like sweet panorama, auto HDR, multi-frame reduction, and handheld twilight. Panorama is another thing that it seems that everybody knows about, but when I show them on the camera, hey, have you been liking playing with the panoramas? They're like, I don't know what has panorama. What are you talking about? So it's actually a really fun feature that everyone should try using. It's right on your dial. It's that little Looks like if you got a rectangle and then squish the top and bottom. And what it does enables us to just sweep our camera across a scene and the camera is going to take up to 120 images, stitch them together for you within a second and be able to give you an outputted resolution that is about 35 megapixels. So you can go left to right, right to left, up, down, down, up. I like to actually set the camera to go up and down and then turning the camera vertically and then shooting. And I'll show you some of those results. But even if it's 28 millimeters wide, it's still not wide enough. Sometimes we really just want to be able to capture the entire scene. And we all know that focal length 
the wider you go, the smaller and the farther away everything seems to be. So now you can shoot a panorama, set your camera to 35 or 50 millimeters and shoot a panorama and be able to compress your space a little bit more and still be able to get a wide angle. There's just no way to do it with a single shot. It's just the way it is. It's not like taking one shot and then cropping it. It's actually getting a field of view that's almost 180 degrees. In some cases, 224 degrees. So. And it enables you to get, you're not losing resolution, you're not losing quality, you're getting the same exact quality as you get out of a full frame or as you get out of the back illuminated uh, one inch sensor. It's just combining those multiple pictures together and stitching them to, and so you don't have to do it on your computer. See the JPEG? It's only a JPEG. It only outputs a JPEG, no raw yet. I don't want to say yet because that makes it elude like I'm saying something's coming out, but it's just JPEG. It's that, I mean, you're talking about a 24 megapixel or 20 megapixel resolution, and if it's taking 100 pictures at 20 megapixels and combining them together, that's a lot of information, that's a lot of processing. Even though we make our own processor, if that was raw, that would be, I think, too much information to be able to, to put together even for a, a laptop right now. So some of the other options that we talked about were multi-frame noise reduction, handheld twilight, HDR. I like to call, just call it image compositing, where it takes multiple shots and then combines them together to give you one image. So handheld twilight. So no, however good the sensor is, no matter what, you can always get into situations where, you know what, even though there is that twinge of noise at ISO 6400, I don't want that twinge of noise. I want to be able to make it look like I shot at ISO 200. So we have handheld twilight where you can actually go outside in, in the, in, at light at dusk and instead of using a longer shutter speed or bumping up your ISO, the camera actually automatically takes six shots. It'll underexpose them on purpose, each one of them, and then combine them together and layer them together to be able to give you one outputted image that gives you much lower noise and without motion blur. So it's essentially negates the need in most cases for a tripod or for bumping up your ISO. So it really does give you fantastic results without having to bring around accessories. Because we all know if we shot a flash in this situation, it would look terrible. Flash is good in sunlight. Flash is not good in really low light situations in most cases. But it lets us shoot in situations where we normally wouldn't be able to shoot. So even though we have a 1.8 lens, and even though we have a really sensitive sensor, or the best full frame sensor ever made, take that a step further and be able to shoot in situations where you never thought you'd be able to shoot before. HDR, everyone's done HDR, a lot of people have done HDR before. It's a real pain in the butt in a lot of cases if you're using Photoshop, where you take the multiple pictures, you bring them home, hope the tripod didn't shake because you had to carry around the tripod to do it, and then go home and use Photoshop for a while, which I still do a lot of the times because it's just a process, it's fun, it, whatever. But being able to do it in the camera and stick your hand out the, the sunroof and be able to capture a full HDR image right then and there is also really fun and be able to see your results right there. So it will take three shots, one for your highlights, one for your shadows, one for your midtones, and then combine those shots together to, be, to give you uh, an image that's outputted without sacrificing quality, without sacrificing anything, and give an outputted HDR image. And it's not the same as, let's say, highlight tone priority or <laughs> our own DRO, where it'll take one JPEG and then adjust the curves to be able to give you more detail in the shadows or give you more detail in the highlights. That's actually manipulating your file and, and giving you uh, loss of detail and loss of quality. This actually takes three separate shots and combine those original, that original information on that image itself. Now imagine going along those weeds on the water in Photoshop and trying to do, no, it'd be a real pain. But, and since it's HDR, a lot of people say, well then I can't shoot motion or I can't move the camera. But even though the bird was flying through the scene, we were still able to capture, it knows that the subject's moving, it knows it's able to analyze the entire scene and break it up into thousands of different situations where it, it can see motion. Not only your motion, but the motion of something that's moving within the frame and be able to keep it still until that one section. Again, digital gives us a lot of opportunity to play with things. It gives a lot of opportunity to really get versatile. And one thing that we're able to do is a thing called picture effects. Everybody does picture effects. Some of us hate them, some of us love them. 
I always say, hey, you can cram as many features as you want in that camera. You don't have to use them. If you don't like it, you don't use it. It's fine. But sometimes it's fun to just play with. And from the 10,000 plus apps on your iPhone or on Android that enables you to do picture effects, it seems like a lot of people like to do picture effects. So another th one thing that we do is HDR, but in black and white only. So why would we do that? Why can't we just change the color to black and white? This enables us to only use the black and white channels, giving us even more dynamic range. So instead of going from nine stops from highlight to shadow, we're able to go to 18 stops from highlight to shadow. So one shot, done. I'm able to get an HDR black and white right out of the camera. Rich tone monochrome. HDR painting, love it or lose it. HDR painting just gives you ultra high contrast, ultra high saturation, HDR. Mm, you love it or leave it. <laughs> Miniature effect. People have seen this through and through. We don't have a tilt shift lens for our cameras and point and shoot cameras never had a tilt shift. So on your full frame, you're able to make it look like you use a miniature tilt shift effect where it'll actually be able to blur the top and bottom, left and right. You can select where you want the line of focus to be and it gives you that miniature effect. So it makes it look like the people in the scene are little teeny tiny miniatures. And to be honest, this, is, this actually works well. I shot a wedding last year when the 99 first came out and I used a miniature effect. So we were up on the roof, shooting down at the wedding at the vineyard and I was just playing around and shot the bride and groom within the vineyard and just had their little slice in focus and the rest was out of focus and that's the one that they wanted. Of all the pictures, that's the one that they wanted 24 by 36 and hung up on the wall. So you never know. It doesn't take much time. It doesn't take any processing. Soft focus. You don't have to use filters to be able to do soft focus. It's built into the camera now in different levels. So you can do low. So a lot of people, when you shoot their picture, like, can you Photoshop me? Ah, it's funny. Well, now I'm going to Photoshop you. I'm just going to shoot you in the lowest soft focus setting, and you'll look gorgeous, and they won't know. It looks fantastic. Here you go. No need to Photoshop. So that was the RX100 Mark II and the RX1. You have the best point, the two best point and shoot cameras that anyone's ever made, and one of them just got made better. So. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.